All right, good morning. Let's, uh, let's give our attention to the Word of God here. Galatians chapter 6. We've made it to the final chapter of Galatians, <clears throat> which will take us four months to work through. No, it won't. We'll go lickety split. So Galatians chapter 6, let's pray and then I'll read the passage, let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus, we thank you that he, uh, he endured humiliation uh, to justify us, and Father, we thank you that uh, his blood atones for our sins, we thank you, Father, that his resurrection <clears throat> um, comes from your power, and Father is um, a triumph over uh, that enemy death. And so we thank you, Father, for doing this work so that we might too rise from the dead and enjoy life as it was meant to be lived in your presence. And Father, we pray as we... we um, look at this portion of the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches of Galatia, that you would bless our thoughts and our meditations. I pray that we would be fed and that we would have answers to questions that we have mulled over in our heads for a long time, that you would even be gracious to supply those answers. And Father, we pray that you would give us wisdom as we approach your word and reverence. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Galatians chapter 6, <clears throat> 1 through 5. As you can tell, my voice is a little bit bassy and raspy. Um, we'll see how long it holds out today. Maybe a very short sermon, who knows? Let me go like this. But, um, yeah, the Dion household is limping out of 2023. And uh, we trust that we'll turn the corner soon. All right, so Galatians 6, 1 through 5. Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But each one must examine his own work, and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone, and not in regard to another. For each one will bear his own load. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> so, the... Um, this passage, probably familiar to most of us, we, uh, it, it's, it, uh, in the book of Galatians, it stands out to us because we get sort of lost in all the justification stuff, and then you come out the back side of it, and there's like this, okay, here's some practical things that I can understand, right? Um, <clears throat> how do we approach somebody who is caught in a trespass? That's what this passage is about. And the first thing, the first thing just to stimulate our brains is, um, and to get us thinking about our approach to other people is some basic questions. How do you think you as an individual affect other people? You know, is it for their good? Is it for their ill? Is it, are you a neutral force in most people's lives, right? You, you, um, you, you're sort of, you make it your point not to get involved in other people's lives. Um, I think that's, that's a lot of people today, right? They, and that's a lot of us, and that's certainly my temptation, but God made me a pastor, so, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's easier for me to get involved in people's lives than it is perhaps for many of you. 
Um, it's an expectation people have of me. It's not an expectation necessarily that people would have of you. And so, um, <clears throat> but, but generally, I think we, we live in a culture where everybody wants to be, you know, to each their own, as they say today, which drives me crazy. To each their own, right? Yeah, can we use the generic masculine? Thank you. Um, to each his own, and, you know, leave, uh, every, I'm fine, you're fine, we're all fine, and everybody has different worldviews and different approaches to this and that and different definitions of sin, and, and, um, and we've negotiated a peace that um, forbids meddling in other people's lives. So we're, we're essentially outlawing what Scripture would define as love, <laughs> right? We're outlawing love. We're outlawing care for one another. We're outlawing what the church should be an example of, love for one another. Um, <clears throat> but think about yourself. How do you affect other people? What is your biggest effect on other people? Do people feel condemned when they're around you? In other words, you're censorious. And so people just kind of feel, feel condemned when they're around you. Or, or maybe you're on the opposite end of the spectrum and you, people feel like you're just open arms to everything and everything you do is just fine and dandy. Sort of all, in, all accepting um, of everything, complete. There's there's nothing you would say to anybody to sort of correct them or confront them or gently um, restore them. Are you a catalyst in people's lives for their growth in the Lord, or are you a catalyst in their lives for their growth in worldliness? Which one is it? <clears throat> Consider the things you talk to other people about. Right? Is it about the Lord? Is it about godliness? Is it about the weather and worldliness? And perhaps you're neither. You have no effect on people. And that's how you prefer it. You don't want people speaking into your own life. And so you will not speak into anybody else's life. You are treating others as you want them to treat you. Right? So you just don't speak into other people's lives. You don't take on the hard, the hard conversation. You're just like, no. Well, Galatians 6 leaves no such option as that. If you're spiritual. Right? Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. So, who are the spiritual? In Galatians, how would we answer that? Christians. Okay. So, bap people baptized? Visible church members? Regenerate? Elect? Those who have the Spirit dwelling in them? Yeah? Okay, what did we just, yeah. What did we just come out of? Those who bear fruit. Yeah, it's the, the fruit bearers. Those are the spiritual. The, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, Goodness, self-control, right? And so, if you exhibit those things, you qualify to be in the spiritual camp. If you're not, you're not in it. You're not in the spiritual. You're not in this group of spiritual, okay? Spiritual persons, whatever we want to say.
Well, we, we'll get there. Yeah, let's, let's hang on. Hang on. We'll get there. Sure, sure, but just... Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right, right. Those passions within us are warring against others and their desires, right? So, the spiritual are to not be... um, And so, how do you determine this? Because every one of us is going to say, well, I bear the fruit of the Spirit. I'm spiritual. I mean, who's going to, like, say, no, I'm not spiritual? I mean, it's very... It's very, we're very subjective when it comes to, you know, determining our spiritual walk, right? So not many people are going to keep themselves out of this. And sometimes the realization is, no, I'm the one caught in sin and I'm not the spiritual one. I need a spiritual person to come and help me. Right now, I'm not exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit and I'm in desperate need of a godly man or woman to um, to get to work on me. So, <clears throat> what keeps again? What keeps us from doing this? We what what do you do when you see sin in another person's life? What are your common reactions to seeing sin in another person's life? And I mean, you have children, some of you. This should be easy, right? And what is your common reaction to it? Anger. Why anger at somebody else giving in to temptation to sin? Okay. Yeah, you're sort of covering your own sin with zeal. And so, yeah, well, sometimes when we see somebody else sinning, our initial reaction is not to be helpful to them, it's to be angry at them. Yep, it really is. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That is my number one. You nailed it. When we hear of somebody's sin, we get disgusted by it. And then we, we're like, that's disgusting. I'm not going to help them. You know, and, and that's a response of pride, right? Because pride is like, I could never commit that sin. It's so disgusting. I am not going to do anything to help that person. They made their bed. They can sleep in it. I am. And you know what? Elders boards have to struggle with this. Elders' boards, when we're doing the work of pastoral care, there are certain cases where all of us are just like, I want to vomit. This is disgusting. And what we all have to do is stop and remind one another, "Mm, yeah, I've probably committed that sin. (laughs) And we can't be disgusted by it, having committed the sin ourselves, if not in actuality in our minds and in our thoughts. Right, And so, that reaction is so common. We see somebody in sin and we're like, ugh, that's disgusting. And immediately your pride alarm should be going off. Because all temptation, right, is common to man. Yeah.
there are some sins that are so heinous that it's just defiling. I mean, even to hear of the sin, and that's why Paul is like, you know, don't speak of what they do out in the open. Um, and so, yeah, the, there, there needs to be a revulsion towards sin generally. But we're talking about how do we help somebody caught in a sin, you know? How do we help that person caught in the sin? And if, you're, if you can't get past the disgust, you'll never be helpful to anybody. You won't be helpful to your own children, because your children's sin will disgust you, right? They, they will lie to your face, and you'll be disgusted by it. And it's like, what, what example have I given you of that? And then you're like, oh, maybe I have given a few examples of that. And hopefully, pretty quickly, you can get off that disgust stage, right? Now, that's, so I, I think that's, that's, I'll speak for myself, but that is a fairly common reaction to sin. And to fight it, you simply just have to know yourself. <laughs> you have to know yourself. And if you, if you don't know yourself, just read Calvin. Read his sermons, because he's always like, you're worse than you think you are. You're worse than you think you are. Every sermon, you're worse than you think you are. And, and, and he says, and he does that because, one, Scripture does that. You're much worse than you, you think you are. God, God wanted to um, dispense with Israel, right, and make a great nation of Moses. And it was only because of Moses' intercession that God didn't just, you know, immediately destroy them. And how many of the prophets came and said, unless you repent, God's going to destroy you, right? And so we're much worse than we think. And Calvin says, there's no deadlier plague than ambition. Each person committed only to himself in seeking to elevate himself by despising his neighbor. Ambition, Right? Not all ambition is bad. There's worldly ambition and there's godly ambition, but he's defining worldly ambition and he defines it as seeking to elevate yourself by despising your neighbor. That's pride, right? That's the, the Pharisee and the publican. That's the Pharisee. I'm glad you didn't make me like, you know... All right, there's another way we respond to, to sin, seeing sin in another person's life, and that is, so there's the disgust, there is this, which may be your temptation, overlook it. Just overlook it. Minimize it. Don't, don't confront, don't talk about it, put the blinders on. Just overlook it, right? Overlook it for a decade. Overlook it for two decades. Overlook the sin um, of friends. And we do that um, as well. Um, Sometimes, in order to overlook it, we begin to flatter those who have fallen into sin. We're just like, we, we flatter them. Either we flatter them with cheap grace... You know, it doesn't, you know, God is, it doesn't matter what you do. God will always be gracious and will forgive you no matter what you do. It's sort of just unnuanced to take on grace, right? And, and then <clears throat> flattering the fallen is what was happening in the, in the church in Corinth. They, they were taking pride in the fact that one of their men was committing adultery. Was committing incest, excuse me. You know? I mean, taking pride in it. Flat, I mean, boasting in the fact that they were such a cosmopolitan group that their sins, you know, you know, you, you couldn't find people like this in other churches. And here we are, all together. And then the other, the other 
and so maybe you're, maybe you're those who are disgusted and back off. Maybe you're those who are tempted simply just to overlook the sin you see in other people's lives. And usually I think overlooking it stems from insecurity, right? How am I a sinner to go and correct some other sinner? You know, how, how in the world can I speak into their life? And, um, well, God tells you to do it, right? And he tells you to do it in a, in a certain manner, which we'll get to, right? And so that's very important, the manner in which you go to somebody. And, um, <clears throat> and so... Uh, Well, there's another, there's another route. Perhaps I haven't, I haven't gotten to each of you yet, and there's another route. You hear of another person's sin, and you go and expose it openly. Pow! You just, you're like, you just go after it, right? You expose it. You, you make a big deal out of it. You're heavy-handed. You're just like, you, you take something that's private, you make it public, you know, you blow this out of the water. And um, <clears throat> that's not good. <laughs> None of these ways are good. We can't overlook the sin, we can't expose it openly, we can't flatter the fallen, we can't be disgusted by sin. All those ways. Which one do you tend toward? Maybe you tend toward all four of those, depending on the circumstance, <laughs> right? Excuse me. Hang on one sec. Yes. Oh, sure. Yes, the, and that's where we'll move now, <clears throat> right? How then do we, um, well, f- the first thing is, is know your temptations. When you recognize sin in somebody else, what, what of those four things we talked about is your tendency, you know? And know yourself and know that you need to train yourself to have confidence to do this if you're going to love your neighbor, Right? If you're going to love those around you, if you don't want somebody to die in their sin, you should feel some obligation to, to help them. Right? He who warns a brother from sin has, has um, what is it? In, uh, it's the last verse of James, right? Um, <clears throat> oh, come on. Yeah, let him who knows, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Right, my brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And we, we don't think about that. We just think, oh, somebody's caught up in a sin. They're a Christian. They're just caught up in a sin. It's not a big deal, right? He's regenerate. He knows the Lord. He's, we all sin. But, he, but James is like, you, you may be catching somebody who is, who is so fixed on that sin that that has become his God and his idol, right? And unless he repents, he's going to die, right? And you don't know, you don't know where people are at. God doesn't reveal that to you. You don't know the status of of the heart, right? But you can see how they behave and respond to it in a spirit of love and gentleness concern, right? And warn somebody. And so how then do we do this? The spiritual are to restore 
in a spirit of gentleness, looking to your own self. Now, there is some discussion in the commentaries about if anyone is caught in any trespass, and that verb there, just caught. We're talking, we are talking about the Christian who falls into a sin, who's caught up in a sin, and who has, who has been assailed and is now given into temptation. This is not somebody living an apostate life who's rejected God and is persistently living in sin. Okay, this is the Christian that falls into sin, right? And is caught up in that sin. And, uh, and so several commentaries make that point. F.F. Um, F. Bruce says trespass. Even the word trespass means an isolated action rather than a settled course of action. So you've fallen into this sin. It's not your pattern of life but you've fallen into this sin. And so that's who it's talking about. Those who fall into a pattern of life, what do we do with them? Well, at a certain point, that, be, that comes before the church, right? And that sort of person would be open to excommunication, right? And formal discipline. This is not formal discipline we're talking about. This is informal discipline of us loving one another in the church and caring for one another. And yes, that even means talking about our sins with one another. So, <clears throat> we do it with gentleness. Um, gentleness, which is one of the fruit, fruits of the Spirit, right? Which is a fruit of the Spirit. <coughs> so, gentleness. What did we say gentleness was? Any recollection of that lesson two months ago? Meekness. Meekness, gentleness, um, <clears throat> being soft with people, being tender, being um, not not approaching them in alarm, not not allowing them to see that you're battling with your own disgust of the sin you're about to confront, right? Not wearing it on your face, not being chicken little and the sky is falling, but just going to them and, look, brother, I've noticed this. I could be wrong, but I've noticed, I've noticed you've, uh, I've, I've smelled some, some alcohol in your breath at church. You know, what's going on? Just ask the question, right? <clears throat> Just ask the question, and then, and then, um, but, but, you know, it's our responsibility to do things like that. I, th- I, I get so fearful that the, our culture right now is just getting atomized and more atomized, and we're becoming more and more individualized and more and more cut off and more and more unwilling to speak into each other's lives. We're so hypersensitive to anything anybody says about us. And we're becoming more and more sensitive. And, and it's very, very difficult for us to take exhortation from somebody else. We just immediately, and I'm talking to myself, we immediately feel like it's an attack. Like this person could not possibly have my best interest in mind. We just immediately are like, you're killing me, right? Who are you to, you know, we, we just immediately go that direction. And I think more and more that's the case. And so that, that whole idea of overlooking people's sins and then saying that that's my gentleness, right? I'm being gentle by overlooking sins. That is us. That is Trinity Presbyterian Church. That is us, right? Because we're all 21st century, you know, American softies. And, it, and I, I'm sorry to say that. I include myself in that. But it's the water we drink. It's the air we breathe. It's, it's, maybe it's the estrogen in the water we're drinking. It's all the pills' fault, I'm telling you. That's a joke. 
It's, it's 90% the pill's fault. <laughs> but this is our responsibility, especially pastors and elders, but you can't get out of this exhortation here you spiritual ones, you can't get out of it by saying, well, that's the work of the elders and the pastor. No, 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 no. Yes, it is our work, but our work is actually when it goes formal. Our work as Christian brothers and sisters in a church is to do this work. But our work as a session is when it gets serious and formal, right? And so this should be, we should be loving one another and being showing great concern for one another we show concern for one another's bodies and illnesses and sicknesses, but very seldom do we show concern for other people's sins. Because that means talking about the things they said and their character and how they interact with people and the awkward situation they put you in and all these things where we just want to go along to get along. What do you do when you see somebody ru- ruining their life with alcohol? What do you do when you see someone flirting with a man, not her husband, in the sanctuary? What do you do when you see somebody skip the Lord's Supper who's sitting next to you? Does it, does it, do you ever stop and think, hmm, I wonder why? It may not be right for me to ask them, but I'm going to make note of it. And if I see that again next month, maybe I talk to them and say, what's going on? You, you've... I've, I've noticed this. You've sat next to me two times and you haven't taken the Lord's Supper. Um, <clears throat> you notice somebody falling off in their church attendance. Why do the elders have to be the first one to contact them? <laughs> right? You, you should. I noticed you haven't been at Triple B. I noticed you haven't been at this. Um, you haven't been at the worship service in over three weeks. Are you, you guys okay? You know? Because I can tell you that church attendance falling off is the first sign that somebody's in trouble. It really is. It always is. It's really a, a, just a no-brainer. What about when you see somebody acting strangely around your children? What do you do? Do you take the the I'm going to overlook this approach and just say he's an eccentric sort of guy? Or do you pray and pray that God would give you a godly approach, a gentle approach to somebody so that you can, rest, you can help them fight this temptation they may have to be attracted to children? but you'd be disgusted by it, wouldn't you? But that's the sort of thing we have to do in the church, is minister to people who have committed terrible sins and sins that we have shared with them. And so the goal is not to embarrass the sinner, but to restore, right? We don't, we're, it's not a shaming activity. It's a restorational activity. We want them to be in good fellowship with the body. We want them to have a clear conscience. We want them to be able to come to the Lord's table with a clear conscience. And so the goal is not to embarrass the sinner, although they may be embarrassed, but it really is to restore. And that perhaps is the hardest aspect. We despise others for their sins. We find them disgusting and so refuse to connect with them. And we do not then have faith for other people's sins. We've got to have faith for other people's sins, right? How many people had faith for your sins? How many people took you by the scruff of the neck and said, you know what? You need to repent. You need to love Jesus, and, and, and he can change you, right? The Holy Spirit can change you. The Holy Spirit changed me. The Holy Spirit changed the Apostle Paul, right? And so when I say we need to have faith for people's sins, I, that's what I mean. We need to believe that the Holy Spirit can work on every, every kind of sinner, right? And yet we don't have faith for people's sins. There are certain sins people commit and we're like, mm, no. You know, that's just on the permanently not going to deal with list. 
And it's amazing how short of a list we end up with of people we're willing to deal with. Right? You might deal with, you know, no, it wouldn't be, you know, a, a man who gets angry at his children. Oh, that's disgusting. That's, a, that's not on the list. Right? Or a, a woman who's immodestly dressed well. No, not going to deal with that. Or, I mean, it's amazing how we could knock down the list to the only person that we're ever willing to really deal with is, is somebody who, on a Tuesday three years ago, had a naughty thought in their brain for a half second. <laughs> I mean, other people's sins, our own sins are a burden, but other people's sins are a ridiculous burden. And so, do you have faith for other people's sins? If you do, <clears throat> if you do, then you're this person, you're the person that will be like this, this uh, strength in a church. You'll be like doing the work so that it doesn't metastasize and the elders have to go to formal discipline, right? You're just like doing this work. You're caring for people. You're having real conversations with them. You're opening up about your own sins, your own past, right? You're admitting your own failures. Yes, powerful way to be gentle with others and say, yeah, I struggle with that same sin. I do. And here's... Here's when I struggle with it. Here's how I've overcome it. And here's how I continue to fight it. And so, have faith for other people's sins. I got a note here that I'm supposed to go to 570 of Calvin's, Calvin's um, sermon on this. And he says, I found this helpful. Here is a summary of what Paul is teaching us here. First... We must not love virtue to the extent that we only delight in those whose life is perfect and blameless. Right? If anybody has the smallest of sins, <clears throat> well, that person's not going to be my friend. I'm not going to spend time with them. They're cut off. Right? We must progress beyond this and show our meekness by supporting those who have sinned because they are not yet as strong in their fear of God as they ought to be. We must aim to bring back to the right path those who have become debauched and turned aside. For if we have no kindness or humanity within, the minute we see someone committing a sin, we will plunge them deep into despair. We see this far too often. This is why Paul says that the children of God must show kindness and gentleness. Then those who have fallen through weakness can be helped up knowing that we desire their salvation. I mean, I could, this, the whole sermon is, is wonderful. But that's a helpful reminder to me. Um, a helpful reminder to all of us. <clears throat> and then, of course... Look, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Now, what do we do with that phrase? There, what do we do with that phrase? In other words, what is, what is the Apostle Paul? What's another? He's said it's about restoration. Do it in a spirit of gentleness and look to yourself lest you too be tempted. What is he, why does he add that phrase? Okay. Take that person, you see them committing a sin, and, and know that you could very well be tempted to, to go down the same path. Right, right. So have the kind of hum, humble self-awareness that you need when you're helping other through a temptation. It is true that when you're when the, here's, here's how temptation 
may have worked in your life. You help somebody through a particularly heinous sin, and it numbs you to a whole host of lesser sins because you've categorized them. And you give yourselves to those knowing that you haven't committed that sin. Right? So it's not even the same sin. that It's just that temptation will come along and you'll be unprepared for it if you, if you just don't have this humility of, of mind and spirit. Um, <clears throat> so he's saying, he's saying here, um, I, I also think he's saying here that there's some people you shouldn't help. <laughs> if your temptation lines up with that person's temptation, you're not probably going to be helpful. Or if you are still in the midst of that temptation, Helping somebody out of that temptation is going to be very difficult. If you've overcome that temptation and put it to death, by all means, you're the spiritual, you're strong, you could be very helpful to that person. But you still have to remember, I'm dealing with this thing again that once had me trapped. I could very well easily go back to it. Okay, And so, so I, I do think there's a warning here that... Um, we can overthink of ourselves as too spiritual and take on matters that lead to really terrible things. More sin. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We get that in verse 3. <clears throat> Bear one another's burdens, thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Um, bearing these burdens, we're fulfilling the law of Christ, which is love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? And this is part of loving your neighbor as yourself, is to... Um, you know, is to correct those you see caught in any trespass, right? And this is a good reason for you to pursue being spiritual. This is a good reason for you to pursue maturity and so that you can be helpful to others who are tempted, right? That's why you need to mature. If you're a father, you need to mature so that you can do this with your own children. If you're a mother, you need to do that for your own children, right? If you're <clears throat> in, in any s circumstance you're in, you want to mature so that you can then be the strength that's needed in each of these situations. But we're proud. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. We don't want to get into the, the mud of other people's sins, so we, we censure and condemn them or leave them to the mess they made for themselves. Um, <clears throat> but what are we in the end? We're, we're sinners saved by God's gracious choice. We're sinners who have had God's gentleness exercised toward us in rescuing us from our sin. We're nothing other than sinners saved by grace. And so we ought, as those who have related to God that way, be able to relate to other people that way, right? We should be able to do that. <clears throat> what are we? We are nothing, right? How's that for your self-esteem, right? You're nothing. You're nothing. 
other than an image bearer of the Almighty God who has been saved purely by God's gracious choice. And, um, but each one must examine his own work and then he will have reason for boasting in regard to himself alone. I, I'll just quickly go through that. I think one of the other things that we have a tendency to do is compare ourselves with others. We do a comparative analysis with others, trying to define in our minds a pecking order of holiness in, in the midst of us, right? And so we compare ourselves with others and, um, <clears throat> and we, we imagine we are doing well because of a comparison we make with someone else who's more debauched than us, right? We think we're doing well because, because we're comparing ourselves with someone else, and we ought not to do that. We ought to compare ourselves with God, and then we realize, okay, yeah, I'm nothing. I'm nothing special. Nothing at all. Good old Puritan worm theology, you know? You're worm. You're nothing. You're nothing. You're precious in the sight of God, but God loves worms, right? And you're a worm. You're nothing. You are, you are almost less than nothing. You're like vapor that's here for a moment and gone, okay? And so that's helpful in remembering and in, in coaxing up the gentleness you need to approach somebody else is just like, okay, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. Perhaps I can be helpful here. But the minute your pride starts doing those comparisons and like, uh, I'm better than this person, and that's disgusting, you know you're not going to be helpful. You should extract yourself from that situation once that, those things start going. But if you can stay in the I'm nothing and God is great, has been gracious to me mode, you might be helpful to somebody else. You might be helpful to your children. Right? So... Here's the, that's our passage today. Any, any final questions, thoughts, concerns? Well, consider these things. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Right? Solidarity. We're all nothings who need help. And we have solidarity with one another in that. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly, and and the more the, the more words, probably the worse off things are going. You know, take take a verse, share a verse, talk to them if they want to open up, have a four hour conversation. But it doesn't always have to be a four hour conversation. It, show your concern in a three minute conversation, brother. I've seen this. Me as a pastor, those are always the most fruitful conversations I have. The longer a conversation is, I find the less helpful it is. But to go up to somebody and say, brother, love your wife. That'll bear more fruit than me preaching four sermons on how to love your wife. Just saying it. You know how to do it. Do we really have to go through how to love your wife? Stop being a jerk. That sort of conversation be, would bear more fruit. than, And so be confident. You're nothing. Be gentle. (laughs) I mean, it feels like we're juggling different things here. But the goal the goal is that we grow in grace and godliness and please our Lord, right?
we got to stop. Yeah. It's it's dangerous. Satire satire is is uh, what the insecure resort to instead of straight talking. And so you have to be if you're a cynical person, you're insecure. I mean, I, I I've learned that about myself. You know, and saying something and you giggle at the end of it because you but you really meant it and yet you but you want to hedge it don't do that either right so it but there's a place for satire for sure um i don't think it's it's not in this context <clears throat> yeah yes True. True, yeah. You, you got to learn how to read people. Yeah. Listen to what they say, what they do. Look at their eye contact. Look at, look at how they interact. It's all very important. It's all very important. We really should be students of people. We really have to stop. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's mostly, and if you're praying as you do it, you're at really asking God to act and use me, a stupid, broken vessel, in that. If there's something helpful, I can say, Lord, please supply it. And, and yeah, you want to see God acting in somebody's life. Yeah, for sure. All right, <clears throat> let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to repent of our lovelessness toward others. I pray that we would be helpful in uh, restoring those who are caught up in a trespass to, um, to godliness and to faith. Lord, I pray that you would uh, recall this lesson in our minds even today as we interact with others. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.